America's wildlife is a national treasure. Images of bears, elk, pronghorn antelope, wolves, coyotes, deer, and cougars inspire us with their natural beauty and majesty. Left alone, nature creates its own balance with each and every species carrying out a vital role in this complex web of life. Today, this fragile web is under increasing pressure from human activities such as ranching, farming, logging, and development. When people move into wild habitats, <laughs> conflicts arise between humans and wildlife. <laughs> to mitigate these conflicts in the United States, the federal government created an agency under the United States Department of Agriculture, which is known today as Wildlife Services. This agency states on its website that its vision is to improve the coexistence of people and wildlife. However, its actual practices have led not to coexistence, but to the horrible deaths of millions of birds and mammals across the United States, as well as the brutal killing and maiming of thousands of pets. I first learned about wildlife services back in 1977 when I moved to Oregon. At the time, they were called animal damage control. And I heard stories of aerial gunning of coyotes, trapping, poisoning of coyotes and other predators. And at first, I found some of these stories actually hard to believe. But then as time went on, I investigated these stories and I started actually having encounters with wildlife services agents and I found that these stories were really just the tip of the iceberg. Where John is standing over here pointing at the end of the measuring tape is where Fritz was caught and killed in the conibear trap, where Fritz's neck was broken in the trap. The deeper I looked into it, the more I saw that this was an agency that was basically running amok, was totally out of control, and seemed to have no authority to answer to. Well, Wildlife Services is one of the most opaque and least accountable agencies that I know of uh, in the federal government uh, outside of, you know, highly classified programs. Uh, their expenditures, uh, utilization of taxpayer dollars is, is even more opaque than the Pentagon, except for highly classified programs again. They're very good at, at stonewalling, uh, ignoring uh, congressional inquiries. You know, they are you know, a world unto themselves, and, uh, you know, that's a world that we're not allowed to see into, even though they are taxpayer funded, they are supposedly acting in the public interest for public safety and for, uh, you know, uh, basically, uh, you know, serious uh, issues regarding predation on, uh, you know, individuals or livestock, potentially. We called it the Wyoming Sting, and it was into the illegal use of pesticides, which brought us in to the Wyoming State Department of Agriculture and wildlife services. There was work being done in Wyoming where eagles that had been poisoned were being located and they were hard cases to make because of the remoteness of it and people would not talk about it. It always seemed that the words eagles, coyotes, wolves led us to poisons and led us to wildlife services or formerly known as animal damage control. So the government started having me buy these poisons from the Wyoming Department of Agriculture. So that's one of the head people over the Wyoming Department of Ag was selling me illegal pesticides that EPA thought had gotten destroyed after 1972. And he was selling that to me so that I could resell it to all the ranchers and the predator boards in the state of Wyoming in the western United States to kill coyotes and eagles or whatever predators, that, whatever problems they had. So as I got into this thing, uh, finally they transferred Agent McKenna down to Laramie and he moved down there and him and I started working together. And we started buying just vast amounts of pesticides, thallium sulfate, compound 1080 strychnine, DDT, everything that had been banned since the 70s 
and the records, official government records show that it no longer existed, we were actively buying it from the Wyoming Department of Agriculture. Now, the interesting thing about that is the Wyoming Department of Agriculture oversees and does all the pesticide inspections and all the M44 inspections that the Wildlife Services employees put out in Wyoming or any other state. Your, you know, your Department of Agriculture actually oversees them. So in Wyoming, it was kind of unique because you've got the person that over, does the oversight, they're, act, they're actively selling all the pesticides. It was like a big, huge drug operation. Most state agricultural agencies, especially in the West, work very closely. They have almost an incestuous relationship with wildlife services. And that here you have the agency that's responsible for enforcing the use restrictions for sodium cyanide, strychnine, compound 1080, and yet they're violating the law themselves. So it really shines a light on there is no enforcement to the use of these deadly poisons by wildlife services. They're out there on their own. They do whatever they want. Our investigations show that over and over and over, and uh, it's basically a free-for-all. I was hunting mountain lions with four other employees. Two of them was on the ground with me. Two of them were in an airplane flying around looking for mountain lion tracks. The plane found two sets of tracks, and they followed the tracks, and then radioed down to us, and we went on the snowmobiles in the direction of where the lions were headed. As we started up the mountain, one of the employees I was working with, his snowmobile stopped, and he said, well, I'm, I need to go up there, so you stay here with my broken down snowmobile, and I'm gonna take yours. So that's what happened. When they come back, they said they had killed two mountain lions, which is no problem. A few months later on, I was, uh, giving the gunner of the plane, I was giving him some instructions on snaring. And while we're riding in the truck, we got talking about those two lions. And he started laughing. He said, those two guys on the ground did not kill those two lions. He said, I shot them from the air. And I thought, holy cow, that's a felony. That is, that's not right, that's a felony. And I'm a retired police officer. I worked 21 years as law enforcement, and retired. I know, quite familiar with law, and quite familiar that we're not supposed to be as government employees committing felonies or misdemeanors or any other type of crime on a taxpayer's money. So I didn't know what to do, but I knew a felony had been committed. The next time I talked to my supervisor, I didn't want anybody to get in trouble, but I wanted that to stop. I didn't, know, didn't want my fellow employees committing felonies. So I just uh, told my supervisor about it. I said, listen, I don't want anybody to get in trouble, but you should talk to these guys and tell them that this is a felony, that they should not be doing it, and not to do it anymore. And up until that time, I was a great employee. When they had a coyote that needed getting killed and somebody else couldn't get it, they had me go in because they knew I could do it. And they always give me my, uh, re my reviews my, uh, were always very good, excellent, excellent. Um, and I was just a golden employee. Uh, then, after that, well, I told him that, and right off the bat, he got mad. And he said, you're a troublemaker. And I said, I am not a troublemaker. I don't want people to get arrested. If they get arrested, and the public finds out about this, if it gets in the media, it's gonna be a terrible black eye for wildlife services, a terrible black eye. We should not be out there as government employees committing felonies. But after that, he called me a troublemaker. After that, he was uh, rude to me. Uh, just was very, just completely different to me after that. I went from being a real good employee to being treated really good to being treated really bad. Uh, a few months after that, I get a letter from him saying that my job was being eliminated. Well, there was really a, a vast array of illegal activities that I actually witnessed too when I was working for Wildlife Services and, and then later on investigating them in the, in the state of Wyoming in the Western United States in the 1990s. When I was working for uh, what we called animal damage control in those days, which is wildlife services, we had a, a, a large different variety of, of violations, especially on the M44s. They, uh, they really were putting no stake signs out, no entrance signs. They were keeping really bad records, uh, no logs at all with a, a second person having known locations on all those devices in case something happened to you when you're in the field. 
mainly those violations on the M44s. Had a couple of instances where I was told by my supervisor for wildlife services that there was enough sodium cyanide in an M44 to kill up to about a 35 pound coyote. And on two different occasions, when I put devices out, when it was really dry, I, I killed two different calves that weighed over 250 pounds with my M44s that were licking the salt and stuff off of those units and they pulled them and they literally were laying dead within just a few feet of, few feet of the units. And when I questioned him about it and I asked him, and I told him, I said, I thought you said there was only enough cyanide to kill a 35 pound coyote and we didn't have to worry about where we put them and it wouldn't kill a human. He didn't really have a response to that. He just said, we just need to get rid of these. So we tied ropes onto them. We drug them off in the brush. And I was told that we were gonna report them as kills by coyotes and that's what we did. So we didn't take credit for any of that. So not only were we killing predators, we were actually killing the livestock that we were there to protect, which a coyote really couldn't have even killed a 250 pound calf to start with. But the fact that that's what I was told by my supervisor and that's pretty well continued on with those practices on those kinds of things on illegal activities and you know we were constantly killing hawks and eagles and different raptors and and always we were told to do the three s's we were told to shoot them shut up and bury them you know shoot shut up and shovel in 2005 i was checking some snares and i was uh there had some snares set in the trail going down in arroyo I checked the snares and I, unfortunately, I had snared an eagle, a golden eagle. He was caught by the neck and he was dead. I went right to my truck, got my cell phone, called my supervisor and said, I just snared an eagle and he's dead in the snare. What do you want me to do? He said, has anybody seen it? And I said, I don't think so. I'm, re I'm really remote here. I don't see any fresh tire tracks in, in the trail here. It's in heavy sagebrush, so I don't very serious, seriously if anybody has seen it or knows that it's there. He said, well, if you think nobody saw it, take your shovel and go bury it. And we were told to do that because it created job security for us. And it was, it was very explicitly told to me that if I pissed off my rancher and I made my rancher unhappy, then my livelihood was gonna end. The rancher had to be happy. He came foremost over everyone. So our record keeping was doctored according to making the rancher happy so that we could continue getting our government funding and we'd have no outside involvement in what we were doing. That was very important. And that was stressed to me from an early age when I first started with them. I am not an animal rights activist. I'm not a wildlife advocate. I am a predator hunter, a predator trapper. I have been all my life. There's not many people on the face of the earth that's killed more coyotes than I have. But I do not believe that wildlife services and the federal government should be in the business of predator control. It should be run totally by the private sector who can do a much better job, much more efficient and, and less cost. The tax shouldn't be doing predator control on the, on the taxpayer's dollar. When wildlife services, they arbitrarily go around killing coyotes. They just go kill coyotes, kill coyotes, kill coyotes, kill coyotes. They say we're killing target coyotes. Well, how do they know they're killing a, tar a target coyote? Does that coyote have a sign say, I'm a bad coyote? And then some of them have a bad coyote and some of them have look up and say, okay, airplane, I'm a good coyote, don't kill me. When those aerial crews, when they see a coyote, they kill it. They don't know if it's a good coyote or a bad coyote. They just, go, they're gonna kill it, that's it. Wildlife services does not have to abide by state fish and game laws. When they, when one of their trappers goes and sets a trap, he can go a week, he can go 10 days, he can go two weeks, he can go a month and not check it. If I don't check mine every 24 hours, I'm in violation of the law and I will be subject to arrest by the game warden. Wildlife services can go, they are not subject to arrest by game wardens. Most states have minimum trap check times. And the reason for this is so animals won't languish in traps over extended periods of time. Wildlife services is not required to, nor do they, check their traps on a regular basis. They can check their traps once a week, once every two weeks, once a month. It's up to them and what time they have available. Here we have a case where a beautiful male coyote, three to four year old male coyote, was caught in a wildlife services trap. And 
it appeared to us that this animal had been in its trap from the extent of its injuries in the tissue for anywhere a week minimum, but possibly two weeks. As we investigated this situation and looked around, we found other coyote tracks within his area, right around him and in the snow around him. And what was interesting is it appeared to us that possibly his mate or another coyote was actually helping him survive, was actually protecting him against other predators and probably bring him food too. And I think this case demonstrates what we've been told by many, many wildlife services trappers is that coyotes are just left in traps a lot of times until they just die. If the American public saw this and understood the brutality and the cruelty of this, that this program would be ended very quickly. You've got to put a gate sign on the entrance to all your pastures so that anybody that would stumble into that area would have an idea that there are dangerous units in there. And we were told if we put that, then all we're doing is advertising for the environmentalists and the tree huggers and people like that to come in and mess with our units and to take pictures and to get us in trouble. So we were instructed not to put those signs on the gates and we were told not to put the unit signs on, on the stake signs. So that way they felt like there's a better chance of them missing the unit by not having the legal signage up than by having it up. So therefore, that's why you're running into these situations where you've got people, they come up, they bend down, they see what appears to be a metal stake in the ground, they reach down to pull on it, and they've got an M44 going off in their face. They have no amyl nitrite, they have no anything with them that's gonna help them or save them. If they're, the only way they'll survive it is if they're lucky enough that the wind was blowing away from their face and they don't get dermal entry on their hand or their arm or somewhere. That's the only way they'll survive it. And even at that, they could end up with permanent brain damage and things like that to them, so, and paralysis. So that was my biggest thing. I've always had a, a large respect for pesticides and poisons and things like that, and always tried to go by the rules. But the more I tried to go by the rules, the more problems that I had with my wildlife service supervisors. And one great example of this is a case in Oregon that we got involved in where we went up a, a dog had been killed, a beautiful German Shepherd mixed dog had been killed, 100 yards from its backyard. This was an older dog. And we went up and investigated it. And we found the M44 that killed the dog, which was still in the ground. And then we proceeded to find, with the help of children in the community, five other M44s that every one of them was illegally placed. They were all placed on a trail on a Christmas tree farm. And the farm had two or three main entrances to it, of which the gates were supposed to be clearly marked with warning signs that these devices were being used there, that they were deadly, and for the general public to be aware of it. Of course, Wildlife Services rarely puts up these signs because they don't want people tampering with these devices. They don't want people in the community to get upset that these devices are there. And they take the chance that nothing will happen and that they won't be discovered and that they'll be able to kill a bunch of coyotes and go along and nobody will know the better. We had issues where we would accidentally kill household pets, dogs, and mainly dogs. And there were endangered species that also got killed, eagles, uh, even buzzards, you know, which fall under the Migratorial Game Bird Treaty Act. A lot of buzzards were killed, but specifically the household pets when we caught those pets, we were told to take their collars off. We were told to get rid of the collars. We were told to bury the dogs and we were told to never report that. That was a very standard practice that we were told all the way from the state supervisor through the district supervisor, through our troubleshooters and us. And that's what we did. That's what we were told to do and that's what we did. So I was told to report by him to the city dump of Uvalde the next morning, which I did. When I got there, I found all of our wildlife service trappers there. My district supervisor was there and also the uh, animal control officer from the uh, city of Uvalde drove up with a truckload of domestic dogs. And what I was told by my district supervisor, the reason we were there, we were field testing sodium cyanide capsules that have an expiration date on them and then once they expire we're supposed to bury them and get rid of them and not use them anymore because theoretically they're not supposed to still be good 
But anyway, he uh, <clears throat> proceeded to uh, load the capsules into the uh, capsule holder, set the ejectors, and he proceeded to get the animal control officer to bring the dogs over one at a time and hold them there and hold their mouth open. And my district supervisor took an M44 and he popped it in their mouth. And within about 30 seconds to a minute, the dog would start whining, you know, they'd start getting paralysis, they'd start dropping down in their, their, their hind quarters. They'd start, they started hemorrhaging like from their nose and their mouth and he'd let go of them and they'd fall over and they'd just be whining. You could you just tell they were in a lot of pain. They didn't know what was going on. You know, their eyes were rolling back. Then he would take the antidote that we carry in our top pocket he would break it open and he would stick the amyl nitrate under their nose and sit there a minute and bring them back alive again. Then he would take another sodium cyanide capsule and again pop it in the same dog's mouth. Then the same dog would go through the same process, fall over. And then they would take and he just kicked them in the side and rolled them off into the garbage of the city dump down there and they just laid down there hollering and whining until they died. There's 26 use restrictions on the M44. Nowhere in there does it ever give you permission to utilize those on domestic animals. As a matter of fact, it's a label violation under FIFRA. You know, it, it, it's, so I guess that was kind of my turning point with Animal Damage Control or Wildlife Services. I got so mad at my district supervisor and we got in such an argument out at the city dump that within a very short period of time, he gave me my walking papers. And I had nothing else to do with them after that. And, and I ended up having to leave the Uvalde district over what he was doing to the dogs. Now, had I not said anything and I would have actively participated in it, because he wanted me to and I refused to do it. I wouldn't do it. Because I've owned dogs my whole life. I love dogs. There's no way I would have ever treated an animal like that. And I thought to myself, it's, it's amazing to me that we've got federal law that protects the public and our domestic animals and things like that. And these guys intentionally violate that law. Wildlife services trappers will also oftentimes have dogs that they use to pursue animals. And they'll bring dogs out with them when they go to get animals out of trap lines. We found out about a case about a year ago, a little less than a year ago, where a wildlife services trapper had done just this. He'd been out with his dogs going on along his trap line. And as he would find coyotes in traps, he would let his dogs loose on the coyotes. And now these are animals that are still alive. We found out about this because this wildlife services trapper posted over a dozen of these photographs on his Facebook page. And first of all, there, there's two things that are important about this. The fact that it, he didn't find anything wrong with posting this on his Facebook page, which I think demonstrates the culture of this agency. And second of all, that he was doing it to begin with, that, that what type of person does this type of thing? The closer we looked into it, we had found, and we've, we've spoken to other wildlife services trappers about this. This is common. This is common practice. They say they do this to keep their dogs trained, to keep them trained for pursuing coyotes, because they also use dogs to just pursue coyotes and rip them apart, kill them. And so there was an investigation done that we were told was still being continued. And through recently discovered material, we found out that the the investigation was concluded last year, last December, 2012, that they found that the wildlife services trapper had violated none of the directives, that he wasn't gonna be fired or reprimanded whatsoever. He still works for the agency. And so obviously these types of activities are still going on. The only thing wildlife services did was they clarified their directives a little saying, you shouldn't do this, but we all know they continue to do this. They will continue to do this. And I think it demonstrates how out of control this agency is. This is an agency that has completely run amok. They answer to no one. And it's been like that 
for since its inception in 1931. They have been a rogue government agency, and they will continue to be a rogue government agency. I've known trappers that do their own thing, and, and they don't care. You know, they're, they don't care what the policies are. And it's obvious to me that most of the top supervisors I've worked with Wildlife Services, they had a total disregard for their own policy. It's not that they need a policy, they disregard the policies that they've got right now. And as long as we continue to fund them with our tax dollars and we keep them in business and they've got access to all these different other entities, the, the state ag departments, the Farm Bureau, the Predator Control Boards, all the private ranchers that want a government handout versus doing their own predator control or hiring a person to do their own predator control, a private person that's trying to make a living. As long as we're funding this great huge entity, then all these things are going to continue. The one thing that I learned, and I learned the hard way from working with wildlife services, is that they lie from the top to the bottom. They lie. And why do they lie? What is their motive for lying? Their motive is, if the citizens of the United States knew what they were doing and how they were doing it, and the animals they were killing, and the non-target animals they were killing, the eagles that they were killing, the, gov the citizens would not stand for it and they would be shut down in a heartbeat. Where's the oversight? Wildlife Services is not capable of reforming itself. Uh, they're going to need a mandate uh, for reform. You know, I did once successfully uh, limit uh, their operations regarding lethal predator control. Uh, an amendment passed the House, uh, but two days later, having gotten uh, a number of uh, the large agricultural groups hysterical in the interim and having them lobby their mem members of Congress, in a very rare vote, uh, it was reversed. So they have powerful allies. Uh, they're essentially subsidizing corporate agriculture in addition to many of the bad things they're doing uh, as an agency. And uh, it, there just doesn't seem to be any will or uh, impetus toward uh, internal reform, so it's going to have to be imposed on them. For over 50 years now, Wildlife Services has been criticized by some of the nation's leading wildlife scientists, by politicians, by conservationists, environmental organizations, by tax groups, and by wildlife services employees themselves. And I think what we're seeing is that this is an agency that is essentially beyond reform. It is so deeply entrenched in a philosophy and view that predators are vermin and need to be eradicated, that this is an agency that's simply beyond reform. And I think especially in this day and age where our tax dollars are so precious that it's time to pull the plug on this program. That it is absolutely incapable of changing and it's time for Congress to take action and end this wasteful program once and for all. Please visit PredatorDefense.org to learn more about Wildlife Service's secret war on wildlife.